Hello, I'm Matthew Gordon from the University of Missouri. In this presentation, I'm exploring regional differences in American English with an emphasis on lexicon or vocabulary and also grammatical features. My uh, emphasis here is on traditional dialect patterns, though many examples will have currency today. Begin by this thinking about this question, you know, what are the most important differences separating dialects of the U.S.? I think most Americans have uh, some general idea of some of the regional differences. They might think of places like New York City or Boston as having distinctive accents, or um, perhaps the South as a large area that has a distinctive way of speaking. Linguists began looking into this question of dialect differences in terms of regions um, in the middle of the 20th century, and one of the earliest products of this was the um, kind of map that you see here. Um, research by uh, people like Hans Kurat um, presented the idea that American English can be divided into three main dialect regions, the North, the Midland, and the South, and you can see how, where those dividing lines are on the East Coast. A little bit more detailed picture, again from Kurat's work, um, which shows you that within each of those large regions there are several subregions. Extending those lines westward, you can see how they play out across the country. It's traditional to distinguish within the Midland region a North Midland and a South Midland, with the boundaries usually drawn about where they are shown here. Here's a different view of regional dialect differences um, from Craig Carver's work based on uh, research uh, done by the Dictionary of American Regional English. So this is based on vocabulary differences. Carver um, does not use the term Midland, uh, but you can see that he still has a division between the upper north and the lower north, with the lower north being the equivalent of the North Midland in other studies, and the upper south and the lower south, with the upper south really being the equivalent of the South Midland. If we think about how dialects differ, I'm sure you can think of lots of particular linguistic features that vary by region. Um, if you've traveled around, you've no doubt uh, noticed that people have different words and different pronunciations for things in different parts of the country. For some historical perspective, we can uh, look in some details at the work of Hans Kurat, we mentioned earlier. Um, Kurat uh, founded the Linguistic Atlas of the United States and Canada in the 1930s, and this was a research project that sent field workers out to interview people in various parts of the United States. began on the East Coast, and the maps I'll be showing you here reflect that part of the country, um, but it involved interviewing people, mainly older people and people in rural areas, because they were interested in a conservative form of English to sort of uh, reflect the earliest divisions along dialect, regional dialect lines in American English. So some examples of this um, to look at. So these, this map here shows different words for dragonfly. As you can see, the open circles in the north are where people call dragonflies darning needles. In the Midland, in places like Pennsylvania, for example, they tend to use the word snake feeder for this animal. And then in the south, along the south coast, uh, they would use the term mosquito hawk or skeeter hawk there. And there are some other uh, forms used as well. But this this shows you the basic difference between the north, the midland, and the south in a single uh, variable, uh, lexical variable. Similar sort of thing with different words for string beans. So you have uh, string beans as the common term in the north. In the midland area, the term uh, green beans is preferred, and in the south, the term snap beans is the preferred term traditionally. A skunk is the uh, normal term in most of the north, but this animal is sometimes called a polecat in the south, as you can see from the open circles there. And then there's an area sort of in between there where both terms, polecat and skunk, are used. The terms for calling your cows uh, in the pasture, right? this is important to recognize that even cows have regional dialects. 
or they understand regional dialects. In the north, the way that you call your cows is with something like kobasi or kombasi. In the south, you would use a term like koi or koench. And in the Midlands, you're more likely to use the term sukau or suki. Again, this, this is a great example to show how the emphasis was on rural speakers. They interviewed people in New York City about how they call their cows in for the pasture, but those responses aren't particularly insightful. Uh, here's an interesting example of a uh, regional difference. The different words for cottage cheese. In New England, the traditional term is Dutch cheese, and that's because this product was associated with the Dutch, who settled along the Hudson River Valley in New York. Um, in that area where the Dutch were, they used the term pot cheese traditionally, which is a sort of a direct translation of the Dutch phrase for this kind of cheese. Um, and it's also interesting to see in places like Western Pennsylvania, you have the term smear case. That may seem like a strange word, but actually it's an anglicization of the German word, uh, the German phrase schmierkäse, uh, for this kind of cheese. And of course, Pennsylvania is an area where had heavy German settlement, the Pennsylvania Dutch are German speakers in that area. Here we see an example of a preposition difference um, that actually still has some relevance today. So when it's 1045, some people might say it's quarter to 11. It's common um, in uh, uh, many parts of the South. Common of, uh, sorry, uh, quarter of 11 would be the usual term in New England. And in the Midlands, it might be more uh, quarter till 11. Our final example of this traditional variation is the second person plural, the well-known form uh, you all or y'all, more likely uh, smushed together today, um, is of course familiar with the South. Um, some of you may have heard of the term uh, yuans or yins, uh, which is particularly prominent in uh, Pennsylvania and well-known feature of Pittsburgh, traditional Pittsburgh working class speech in particular, yins there. Um, and of course, you've also heard uh, forms like use um, in other places as well. If we turn our attention now to just mention a few of the vocabulary differences, lexical variables that are still uh, currently relevant today. Of course, probably the first thing that comes to mind are different terms for carbonated beverages. Um, this map from an online survey is kind of fun. It shows the uh, main differences here between pop, the areas of blue, and a soda, the areas of yellow. And the third uh, popular variant is Coke as a generic term. So Coke is common throughout much of the South as a generic term for pop or soda. A um, couple of other variables, uh, teeter-totter or seesaw for the name of that uh, playground equipment there. Um, this variable shows kind of an interesting distribution. Now, what you're seeing here are maps from the DARE project, the Dictionary of American Regional English, and so the states are resized according to population, which is why they look kind of funny on this map. Um, but what you can see here, the map on the left shows you people who called this piece of equipment a seesaw, and the map on the right where they called it a teeter-totter. So it's basically if you cut the country in half diagonally, um, in the north and western parts of the country, teeter-totter is the dominant form, and in the south and east parts of the country, seesaw is the dominant form. And for those of you from Missouri, you can see that line pretty much cuts across Missouri in the same way. So people from the eastern part of the state tend to use seesaw, and people from the western part of the state tend to use teeter-totter. Just mention briefly a couple of other of lexical variables that are common. Uh, uh, when you go to the grocery store, do you have your groceries put in a bag or a sack? Um, firefly versus lightning bug, another uh, well-known feature. Um, goosebumps versus goose pimples, or sometimes even goose, goose flesh, that's different. And for those of you from St. Louis, you know about the special vocabulary word Hoosier. Hoosier as a term of derision, sort of equivalent to something like a uh, a hick or a hillbilly or um, some just sort of a general term for someone who uh, is lower class or behaves in a, in, a, in a way that you disapprove of. 
um, Hoosier there. So of course Hoosier um, comes from uh, the name of the people from Indiana, and um, in most parts of the uh, in most parts of the United States, Hoosier only means someone from Indiana. But in the St. Louis area and spread out from there, um, it has acquired this special um, general meaning of uh, of term of derision. Turning quickly to a couple of grammatical features, it's actually a little bit more difficult to think of grammatical usages that vary in terms of dialect region. Um, we can think of lots of grammatical usages, like things like double negatives and so forth, but those don't really vary by region. Those are found all over the English-speaking world, um, and they may vary by social class or other dimensions like that, but not generally by region. Uh, I will mention just a couple uh, examples along this line. One that is familiar is a prefixing. This is something that's found in the South Midland, particularly associated with Appalachian English, and um, it occurs in sentences like this. He just kept begging and a crying and a wanting to go out. So it's the use of that a as a kind of prefix to ing participle verbs. Uh, I knew he was a telling the truth, but still I was a coming home and so forth. So. Um, again, I think this is pretty familiar to most um, Americans. You've heard this before. Um, it is restricted, so it's not any ing form. You can't use it with jaron, so you can't say something like "I like a hunting," um, and of course you can't use it with uh, uh, ing words that have become adjectives like "charmin." So you can't say the movie was a charmin. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. This is important in a historical context uh, that a, ah, which has sort of fused to become a prefix, was originally a separate preposition uh, with the form on, meaning in or on. So a phrase like he was a fishin originally comes from something meaning like he was in the act of fishing, right? That's the uh, how we got to from that preposition to the current phrase there. And uh, we saw an example earlier of Shakespeare's usage of this to show that this was a um, pretty widespread in earlier forms of English, so he writes, when green, great, when green geese are a breeding. Uh, one final form, a uh, grammatical variable that's, that's really interesting in the uh, Midwest is what's called positive anymore. This is a particular use of the adverb anymore. So if you look at the first example here, there are no good places to study anymore. This is an example of sort of the regular, everyday, standardized form of uh, anymore, where it's used in a clause where there's a negative form here. So there are no good places to study anymore. Right? Um, so that's that's not the unusual form. The more dialectally re restricted form are seen in the other two examples. There's a coffee shop on every corner anymore. Notice there's no negative element in the sentence, and yet anymore appears. The meaning there, for those of you who aren't familiar with this usage, the meaning of anymore is something equivalent to nowadays. So there's a coffee shop on every corner anymore means nowadays you can find a coffee shop on every corner. Or sometimes the anymore is fronted to the beginning of the sentence and so you might have a form like anymore most bottles are twist off so this is an exact this is what we mean by positive anymore it's the use of anymore in a sentence without any negative um, uh, element in the verb phrase there um, this is as I said associated with the uh, the Midland dialect region it's very widespread in places like Iowa Nebraska uh, Ohio Illinois and so forth um, and occurs also in um, Missouri. Um, it's more common in uh, places like Kansas City and northern Missouri than it is in places like St. Louis and uh, parts of southern Missouri, but it is nevertheless heard all over the state.